Hi there. This is Visitation's Conversation. The purpose of this program is to provide inspiration to people aspiring to go deeper into the world of comics and entertainment. Please check out the channel for interviews that range from comic creators, podcasters, cosplayers, and filmmakers. My name is Scott Larson, and I am the creator of the independent comic book series, Visitations. Visitations is the history of Chicago as seen through the eyes of the residents of the city's oldest cemetery. It's part history, part adventure, part horror, uh, all rolled into one. It's kind of like Indiana Jones meets the Untouchables in a graveyard. Um, if you're interested in reading a free digital copy of the first issue of Visitations, uh, please email me at visitationscomicbook, all one word, at gmail.com, or you can click on the link below. Uh, today, I am very excited because uh, my guest is Tom Hutchinson, and Tom is the uh, publisher of the independent comic book company, Big Dog Inc., which has been around for a little bit over a decade, I believe. And he's going to come on and talk to us a little bit about his career, how he got started, and, uh, and some other good stuff. So, Tom, whenever you're all set. There, there we you go. are. Hi, how you doing? Doing well. How are you? Good. Good, good, good. So, um... Thank you very much for coming on today. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Good to be here. And uh, so I have, I have a few questions for you. And the first question is, is um, what, what was your first exposure to comic books? Was it through movies, what, through, through TV shows, cartoons? Uh, well, it, it's, it was sort of all a mix of that. So my first ever comic book was Godzilla number 16 from when Marvel was doing it way back in the day, back in the seventies. Uh, so I was out here, uh, Michigan summer vacation and there's a, a, a flea, flea, what do they call them? The flea market, uh, out here called Trufant. And, um, I was wandering around. I don't know how old I was at the time, seven, eight, something like that. Just wandering around, saw a stack of comics. I had no idea what a comic book was, but on top of that stack, was a Godzilla comic book. And I knew what Godzilla was because I'd seen that on TV. And so I picked it up and I was like, well, I don't know what this is, but it was like 50 cents. I plunked it down, took it home. And that was it. That was, you know, my, my lifetime uh, of comics began at that point. Uh, it's, it's never really ever ceased. It's gone from collector to, uh, or well, I guess from reader to collector to, you know, helping someone run a shop to owning my own shop uh, into now writing, into publishing. Um, every, every aspect outside of, I mean, maybe even in a way distribution, I've, I've, uh, I've dealt with that because now we do Kickstarters, but um, mm -hmm. really everything that, that, that we can do in comics, I've had some uh, finger in the pie at some point. So when you were, when you started out collecting, what were you collecting besides Godzilla? Um, well, it, it started with Godzilla and then, you know, uh, just, I wanted more. So I went back and got mm -hmm. more, but then as you're reading, you know, there's ads for other Marvel books. So there's like Ghost Rider in there and things like that. So it was sort of a natural progression of what did I see in the comic? Okay. Mm -hmm. Ghost Rider. Tell me what a Ghost Rider is. Go watch, go get a Ghost Rider book. Okay. I'm reading a Ghost Rider book. What's an X-Men? Go find an X-Men book. So it was just this sort of natural progression of things. And then it, it, it did reach a point at one time to where it was just, okay, comics exist and I'm seeing DC comics and I'm seeing, you know, whatever uh, uh, the 80s indie boom was happening. I'm seeing things like Elf Quest. At, at some point, it just became a universe of comics versus just, you know, that Marvel segment. But um, I remember once uh, for Christmas, Sears, the old Sears catalogs, they used to be able to buy um, basically a, a comic collector's pack. So you got like 100 just random comics. Mm -hmm. And so in that, you know, you had Alpha Flight and you had Iron Man, you had the Avengers, just stuff that I had never really experienced. Um, Cause that was kind of before, well, well before really the comic book store existed. It was still like in the, in the markets, you know, the seven 11s and things like that. So um, I was seeing a lot of stuff that I had never really seen other than maybe some advertisements. And that just kept the boom going. So, um, so you said you worked in a comic shop. How old were you then? I was just out of high school. So it would have been about 18-ish, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, 1990, 91, right before everything went crazy, <laughs> right before everything was, mm -hmm. well, Image Comics came out, right before everything was selling a million copies, um, all that kind of stuff. So right at that early moment, I was 
uh, working at a guy's shop, basically doing inventory, restocking the, the, the books and stuff, uh, helping out on new comic book day. And then that I was there for a long time. So it just grew into manager. I was helping literally run the place, like making decisions of, you know, what do we do? What do we order? How do we set up the store? All that kind of stuff. Um, and then that led into, uh, the late nineties where I had my own shop, um, which I had, um, 90, when did we do it? 90, 98, I think something like that. Um, and that lasted until of course, September 11th, when, uh, we had our, our problems in New York and our town basically shut down. So almost everything that was like a retail store just died overnight, uh, mm-hmm. after nine 11. So, um, from there I, I fell back into some other stuff, uh, doing, um, trading cards and sports cards for, uh, a company that we worked with the NFL and NASCAR and MLB. And we were doing trading cards and sports cards on their websites. So we did that for like eight years. Um, and then that's when I fell into the writing side of comics, wanting to make comics. Um, and, and that's when it kind of took off and, and took in that direction. So, okay. So I want to go back real quick. Cause I'm curious. Um, I, I, and you know, we've talked before and I knew that at what point you had been local to Illinois, were you in New York when all this was going on? No, no, no. I was in California when all that went down, but okay. after nine 11, you know, people were like, well, we're under attack. Uh, we uh-huh. don't know if there's going to be another, we don't know if I'm in LA. So that's a prime target for problems, sure. you know? And so, um, people just stopped spending money. You know, I mean, that's just the way it was. They were like, well, we have to spend money on food and things that we need. And so mm-hmm. buying comics was like, well, we don't, we don't need this right now. Um, same with all the other just random sort of retail shops in this sort of, it wasn't really a strip mall. It was like this. It's a really nice, it's called Montrose, California. Uh, it's a really nice street with just shops on both sides of it, restaurants mm-hmm. and so on. It's kind of an outdoor mall. It's really nice. Um, but people just stopped shopping. And so, uh, you know, we, we had to close down and, um, you know, that's, that's just the way it worked out. It's interesting. Um, I actually hadn't heard anything like that before, which is why I was asking the questions about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, so how did you start writing? Where did that come from? Was, did you know someone needed (laughs) needed a writer or no, 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 no. Uh, (laughs) I originally, I wanted to be the artist. Uh, I was big Uh art guy. Um, I even was a, an art dealer for a while. I mean, just on my, not like big art dealer, but I dealt in original pages and stuff. Um, but I wanted to be an artist, but I, I, I quickly realized that. Um, th- Why is somebody calling me right now? Uh, <laughs> I, I quickly realized that uh, the art side wasn't going to work for me. I mean, even if I was getting okay at drawing a figure and so on, Mm-hmm. once you move into okay well now i gotta draw buildings with perspective and horses and cars and trees and i was like oh my god i, I don't have that in me it's just not gonna happen i don't have that kind of lifetime um so what had happened though is during my art time i had created critter uh which is the the first comic book character that i wrote um and i created her just because i wanted to draw something besides the x-men I was drawing all these things that I was like, okay, whatever. But I got bored of drawing those guys. So I was like, well, I'm just going to make my own thing. And I'm going to draw her because again, when you're drawing comics, they have to look the same over and over panel, panel, so on, so on. And I want to draw something that was interesting to me. Uh, but that kind of all flopped when I was like, okay, now this is, this is not going to work. But I was kind of at that point engaged in the character because even as I was drawing her, changing costumes and stuff, like, story things came into my head like okay if she's wearing this costume what does it mean where would she be what would she be doing and so that's kind of what sparked the the writing side of things for me um was was creating my own character just sort of because uh and and even though it was just because um that's that's how it all all went into place and um the original script is nothing like what we have uh now after 12 years of of the book um but it was fun to, to, to kind of look back, see where you started, where did it go, how did it go, uh, get some character designs from real artists. Like, yo, I got this character, but I can't draw this well. I need a visual, you know, that I can really key in on to write this story. Um, so Adam Withers did a bunch of character designs for me, including Critter herself. Kind of solidified the direction that the character was, you know, going kind of on her own but you know sort of through 
whatever manipulations I was giving her because she was brand new. She could be anything. Mm -hmm. Um, But as Adam did his job and kind of gave me these like, well, let's do this and let's do this. And I was like, well, yes, no, hey, what? And suddenly it just was like, oh, wait, that's that's it. That's what we want. That's perfect. Um, And then from there, it was just like, okay, let's dive into the script because now I can see who she is. And then he was doing other characters uh, as well, helping me out flesh out the universe but once i could really see them and really get a sense of like okay there's a cape okay there's a tail okay there's gloves okay whatever there is that helps you you know really flesh out the story even further um and and that's that's where it all kind of came from so um where did you how did you find him adam oh it was a website that i'm not sure still exists it was called digital webbing um Mm -hmm. this is way back um, many years before I published anything. Uh, so I actually started, well, I've been publishing now for 12 years. Um, I started doing all of this maybe maybe like five years prior, just kind of trying mm-hmm. to figure out like mm-hmm. what, what, what is making a comic? Like, what does it mean? How do you do it? Um, and so we were doing all kinds of art and stuff and just kind of posting it up there. But they also, what was cool is they had a, uh, a classifieds section where you could post for jobs. I need character designs. I need colors. I need whatever it is. And so I posted it there and he answered the ad and uh, uh, he was fantastic. And and we're still friends to this day. I'm in Michigan now. He's in Michigan. So we see each other at the cons that are local here. Um, every time we get new critter stuff out, I make sure he goes and gets, you know, copies of the book. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, this is, this is here because you helped me do this, man. So um, that was, yeah, it was digital webbing, which is, uh, I, I, again, I don't know if it exists, but um, if, if anybody wants to go check it out, digitalwebbing.com uh it used to be an old what would they call them forums site where you could like mm-hmm. post comments and and subjects like here's my thing tell me what you think and people would talk about it and so on and so on um but i don't know if it still exists so i i don't know you know it's funny because that's um that's actually where my first professional jobs came from as well was digital webbing um it was there and there was a play a thing called comic space i don't know if you yeah that. yeah that was that, my, that uh, one. the myspace version for comics which lasted right. i don't know a year yeah it was there for a little while and then one day it just was gone yeah but yep. uh but digital webbing yeah i had answered a number of ads i'm actually kind of it's kind of funny that we didn't cross paths because it was probably about 2006 2007 was when I was on there doing that and mm-hmm. it ended up leading to a lot of different things for me. So I mm-hmm. thought it was a great site. I haven't even thought about it for a long time, <laughs> but I haven't even gone to take a look, but I'm yeah. curious as to whether it still exists or not as well. Yeah. Um, so, so, so you started doing, doing your own, your own writing, you had an artist and now was Adam doing the coloring or did you find someone else for that? They, that's a good question. I, I don't remember. I, I I honestly I don't remember. Um, I want to say that yes, he did because I know he and Comfort they kind of team up on that stuff. But it's entirely possible that it was somebody else. That's so far back um, yeah. that uh, and I and thinking about it, the way the colors look, I'm not sure it's their style. So it's possible I I took the lines and gave them to somebody else because at the time also I, I'm not sure I was learning everything. So it didn't make sense to me that there was like artists that color their own things like i was like what that's that's that doesn't happen um now it happens all the time uh but uh so i i I would guess somebody else probably colored them because the styles of the color uh kind of vary and i think i was just kind of it's like okay i need this one done now and i just kind of put it out there this one needs to be done now i put it out there um sort of as needed so and then how did you start publishing did you just publish that one book uh, yeah. kind of like a self-publishing thing and then it yeah. just grew from there or yeah so. basically uh so when i was working at the comics or not the comic shop the uh the card shop um we ran into i don't know when it was 2009 whatever when the recession hit us and mm-hmm. again same thing as, as 9-11 right it's like people decided they didn't need to buy three inch pieces of cardboard anymore so um so i got laid off from that job that i had for for eight years but I had already started doing the comics. Like I already had that sort of going. I had Critter going and I had Penny for Your Soul going at kind of the same time. And they were all just back burner because the whole idea was just to have fun with it. Let me see if I can make a comic. We'll go to local cons. We'll just muck around and, and whatever. Um, but when I, when I got laid off of that job, it was like, well, 
let me see what I can do with this first before I go apply to Walmart or whatever. Let me just see what this is. Let me get into the industry a little bit more, understand. So I started to pitch. I pitched to six different publishers, all the normal publishers that you'd expect back in the day. I got no response. Not even a no. I got no responses. Uh, save one, um, which was a very nice letter from uh, um, Red 5 Comics. Um, and they said, basically, well, we have something that's similar. We don't want to overlap. I was like, I get it. I appreciate the, just the, the, the shout out. I mean, um, everything else was a, was just zero. Uh, and so basically at that point, there were two options, um, go apply at Walmart or get really, really pissed off and figure out how to go do this myself. So I put the chip on my shoulder and I went out and, and we decided, okay, we're going to try and figure out how to do this. Um, and so we published. Uh, Penny for Your Soul first, um, only because it was done first. Critter was started first, but uh, timing-wise and schedule-wise, it just didn't get done first. So Penny for Your Soul came out first in 2010, sold out immediately of the three 3,500 copies that we printed. I mean, like gone. Um, I was still upset though, because I was like, man, I wanted to get to like 5,000 or something. Like I had these numbers in my head that, that were based on nothing. But I was like, I want to sell that many. So, but my rep at Diamond was like, look, nobody knows who Big Dog Inc. is. Nobody knows what Penny for Your Soul is. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody knows who your artist is. Nobody knows your colors is. Mm -hmm. No, you have no special covers. You have no variants. And you sold 3,500 units. Mm -hmm. That's, the, they, Diamond literally told me, that's freaking impressive, man. And I, so I kind of stepped back and I was like, okay, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll buy all of that because it was all true. Um, no one knew hiding her hair of who we were. Um, and we put out the books bi-monthly versus monthly because I wanted to make sure we, we could stay on time. And the interesting part was when we sold issue two, and this is a key, guys, if you're going to go into the comic book market, this is so key, I think, right now. Because we were soliciting number two because of the way that the diamond works, you have the catalog, it's two months ahead of time. You're buying the books. So we solicited number one. They bought their 3,500 copies. They came out two months later. They were on the shelf selling when they were ordering number two. So there was no guesswork. Mm -hmm. They could see what was happening on the shelves. Our number, th our number two orders had virtually no attrition because the people that bought the book saw the book selling. Hey, we bought five copies. Five copies are gone. Oh, well, I guess we need to buy four copies instead of two copies on this. So our attrition was almost zero. It was like less than 5%. Um, for those that don't know, basically when a comic comes out at a number one, let's say it sells 10,000 units, generally the attrition rate will cut that in half immediately on the next issue because comic shops will buy more number ones because there are speculators and people will try number ones um, to see if they'll like it. But the inherent uh, uh, ordering system is I'll buy 20 number ones, I'll buy 10 number twos. Uh, mm -hmm. And so numbers just fall straight off a cliff. But with us, um, we didn't have like a 5,000 to 2,000 that, cause that would have, I would have, would have broken me, but we had like a 3,500 to like a 3,200. And we just kind of hung around that number, like that 3,000 all the way through the series. We just kind of seven issues, by the way, um, put out every two months. So they were seeing the book sell as the, they were ordering the next issue. I think that was key to our success because if they had to guess on number two without seeing the book, um, those numbers would have fallen off. And then I don't know if we would have gotten back on number three. Like even if number one had sold well, there's no telling where you would have had to, to sort of reset. So I think we did uh, ourselves a big favor with uh, going bi-monthly. Um, all right. So I want to back up because I've got a number yeah. <laughs> of questions about all this stuff that you said. And it's interesting to me. Um, so you decide to self-publish. Yeah. What made you decide to go through Diamond and do it through comic shops as opposed to just doing it yourself and selling like table to table? And because at the because at the time, well, multiple reasons. One was the chip. It was right there and it was really big. And I wanted to show everybody that said no that we could do this, that the book was worth putting out on the market, that it would get attention. So number, that was number one. Number two, the only way to really do that is to be in comic stores. Um, yes, you could go to comic cons. That was still on our, 
our plan. We still did cons, all that kind of stuff. You had to show the book to people too, because then those people go back to their store and say, order me number two, order me number three, order me number four. Um, so we did all of that as well. But back in the day, there was no crowdfunding. Uh, you know, there was very little even social media at that time. Um, this is, this is early days of Facebook and, and, you know, Twitter. I mean, it, it, it almost didn't exist. So at that point in 2010, that was the way, as we say now. Um, and so we dove in, uh, diamond immediately accepted us. There was no question. They were like, this is a cool book. There's nothing really like it on the stands right now. Uh, your art is cool. We're going to put you in the, in the book. We did buy an ad. We bought a, uh, 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 like a, a quarter oh, ad. Um, yeah. Like a vertical quarter ad. Um, that was all we had. That was it. We had a vertical quarter ad and then our general placement in the catalog. <clears throat> that was it. And somehow that was enough for people to find us. Um, Cause again, I mean, I didn't have any connections to retail stores. This was all mm -hmm. from absolute zero having to build every tiny little piece to create just your foundation of anything uh, to, to then be able to build, you know, once you, once you've hopefully, um, gotten the, the industry's attention, which we did pretty quickly. So, um, so how did you get it? I mean, how did you get it printed? Did you, you, you obviously went to your own printer. What, yeah, uh, we just, I just found a printer. I, I'm assuming that that was probably a digital webbing thing as well. Okay. Um, we found some guys down in Texas that, that printed our first, uh, seven issues of Penny for Your Soul. After that, we got, uh, picked up by a different printer in Indiana, uh, and they've been printing our stuff ever since. Um, so first year was was down Texas. I was not thrilled with them, um, but at the time I didn't know why I wasn't thrilled with them. But now, looking back, I'm like those guys were jackasses. Um, but the new guys we've been with for 11 out of the 12 years, uh, they're fantastic. For anybody that wants to know, they're called Rink Printing in Indiana. Uh, they do amazing, amazing work. They're not going to be the cheapest on the planet, but the quality of the work that they do. I mean, if you guys have seen our books, uh, the quality of the work speaks for itself. So I'm, I'm super happy with them. Um, do you think that, and, and this is just, this a question. So you talked about the chip on your shoulder, mm -hmm. but how much do you think just general ignorance about the, um, about how oh, about it? hundred percent. A hundred percent. So if you knew more, yeah. what would you have done differently? And what do you think would not have worked? Um, I, if I had known more, uh, I, nothing would have really changed. I just would have been better at it. Um, if, right. if I had, if I had been mentored, if I had been, if I had worked for a publisher at some point and I, it's, it's, I think all of my, all of my information really, I think came from the retail side because I had been in that for so long whether it was running that dude's store during the peak of everything in the nineties or running my own shop, um, everything, I understood the retail side a lot. I kind of felt like I knew how to make a book that the retail side would look at and pay attention to. And so that's kind of where the chip came from. Cause I'm like, yo, all of you guys are just going to ignore me. Like not even a, 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 a Hey, what's up? Like nothing um, that really bugged me because I thought that we really had something that people would dig on. Um, even if you wanted to just, just talk to me about it and be like, I don't think this is going to work. I think this is a problem. I mean, tell me something, tell me, tell me what to fix if, if something mm -hmm. needs to be fixed. Cause I, then I, then I can fix it. Edits are, are part of the, the industry, but I got nothing. And so, uh, that chip coupled with my retail experience and knowledge, um, I think helped me understand how to eventually uh, talk to the retail side and, and make them sort of be like, yeah, these are, these are cool books. Um, and again, you know, we've been here now for 12 years. We've had multiple books on the diamond top 300, not the 500 that it is now the original diamond 300. We've had multiple books there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'd say for, for an absolute uh, out of the blue, out of nowhere, nobody knows who we are company creators books um and now we're we're a, a standard you know quarterly kickstarter funding machine um i'd say we've we've done pretty well for ourselves i would say so as well and i have a couple more questions on that 
Yeah, of course. Um, on, on your process. So, so you said you sent stuff to like the major publishers, you know, and however many there are and everything, and that you didn't hear anything back, which is common. I mean, that's like, that's just the way it goes. They probably never looked at it. Um, how many times did you send the stuff off? Just once or more than just once? Once. once. Okay. Because after that, I was pissed and I was like, I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I dove into how do we do this? How do I talk to Diamond? What do they want? What do they want to see? Let's just freaking go, man. Um, because, because the, again, I was I had no job. So there's no reason to sit around waiting for these guys forever. Sure. Uh, forever never came. I mean, even now, I still, it's not like they found the submission 12 years right. later. And they're like, oh, hey, like, let's talk to this guy. Um, so it was just, let's go. And, and um, you know, I, I, we did local cons. We expanded out quickly. I was doing things in, I was doing like heroes con in North Carolina, I was doing mega con in Florida. I mean, I was everywhere with basically two issues of a comic. So, you know, we were hemorrhaging cash at the beginning, but if I hadn't done that, if I hadn't put myself out outside of this California pocket that I was in at the time, um, we never would have been able to uh, uh, reach that larger fan base because back in the day, boys and girls. Let me tell you about when comic cons were about comics uh, and not movie stars and, and voice actors and so on, because people actually went to comic cons for comic books. And so um, we did really well with sales. Obviously we didn't have enough product to really warrant all these things, but over time we did, we built into it. We grew into it. Um, that's where some of the variants came in as well. We had some help with some folks that did variants of their own on our books uh, J Company Comics did their own variants on our books. And then we eventually just kind of grew into the variant market naturally on our own uh, towards the, the back end of our first year. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, I, like we talked about earlier, I was, a, I was an art dealer for a while. So I felt like I had an eye for talent. I knew kind of what I wanted on the covers. I knew the styles that I wanted. Um, and, uh, you know, eventually we found people like, Jim Brumall, Natalie Sanders, Ian Snyder, uh, Jose Luis was my first artist for Critter. He's been working for Marvel and DC and everybody ever since. Um, you know, so I felt like I had the eye for it. And, uh, you know, again, our, our sales kind of speak to that. So um, I just, I rode what I had and what I knew as hard as I could. Um, and, and anything that I didn't know, we just figured out along the way. Um, so you send the submissions off. How long did you give them to respond? That's a good question. I, I don't remember. I really don't remember. Probably best estimate would be I probably sent them off in the summer of about 2009-ish. Um, probably about six. Well, I knew that there was a con coming. So huh. the first ever Long Beach Comic Con was late in, in 2009. Um, and so I knew we had to print books. So I was waiting until I heard something from these guys b before I printed my own books. Because if they wanted the book, then I wasn't going to make any books. I was like, okay, well, we're just not going to do the show because it's going to go to Image or whoever's going to take it. Mm -hmm. um, but as we got closer and closer to the con, I, I had nothing. And so I was like, I want to do the con. It's, this, is, this was the whole point was we're going to do local cons. We're going to blanket the, the, the area. Um, we drove around all the retail stores eventually and so on, but I wanted to do Long Beach Comic Con. So technically we started in 2009, uh, but that was just basically, we made a large print run of each of the books, Critter and Penny for Your Soul. Um, and that was just to do cons because we weren't even in Diamond at that point. Um, we didn't get into Diamond until what would it, maybe, maybe we talked to them in January, which means we were in, January, or maybe we were going to be in Diamond in January because then we released our first book in March. I think that sounds about right um, in 2010. Uh, so we did that con before we were in Diamond. We had our big run of books. Um, and then when we went into Diamond, all those books that we had printed for Critter and Penny, they were gone, whoosh, out the door. Um, and so we had nothing left. So, uh, you know, we had to do some second prints for Penny for Your Soul um, and so on and so on and so on. So, uh, that was kind of the, the, the loose timeline. So technically 2009 is when we started, but 2010 is when we were officially published and in comic book stores. So, so you started, you, you did start 
by going to conventions before you got into comic shops. Yeah, only because it was just a, a new local thing. Like if that hadn't mm-hmm. existed, I would have we would have probably done something in 2010 at some point. Like mm-hmm. so again, the cons were always on the table, but it was always how do we get the book into stores? You know, the, to me, the 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 comic cons were the marketing tool. You know, obviously we want to sell books and make money there, but it was thousands of people would come to a con and it's like, look at my book, look at my book, look at my book. Cause we don't get to make Super Bowl ads for comic books, you know? So comic cons are for a publisher, for a writer, not necessarily for an artist uh, because they can draw and make money. But for us, it's, it's marketing. It's putting your book in somebody's hand. Like there it is, put it in your hand, take it home. Um, and so I think that also helped because we did that. Uh, prior to being in Diamond, and then Diamond came out. So we got word of mouth, I think, a little bit before we were actually in the catalog, so that when the catalog came out, some people uh, knew what was going on. They were like, oh, yeah, I saw these guys in Long Beach. And uh, so there was a little bit of talk, you know, in the back in the day of the blogosphere, whatever you know, mm-hmm. whatever it was back there. Um, so we had a little tiny ripple of just sort of, um, you know, groundswell from that con because because people liked what it was but it was no it was no great shakes but it was enough to do something i guess because then when we were in diamond you know we got the numbers we did and um it took our whole print run out so when you guys got into the diamond catalog um did you did you call up like different shops and say hey this book is in the diamond catalog it's our first one would you be willing to buy it or did you just kind of like let it ride Okay. The only thing I did was I drove, I did the, I did the Los Angeles circuit. So uh-huh. I went in person to stores. Okay. Like, Hey, here's our book. Here's our, book. and we went to Las Vegas cause that was close. Uh, San Diego. Cause it was, cause we did some, you know, we did Southern California ish mm-hmm. things, Arizona as well. Um, which is where we ran into Jesse James comics and who's become one of our biggest uh, supporters uh, in all of our 12 years. Um, so we did a very sort of SoCal plus circle um, to kind of talk about the books. Uh, <laughs> got people that were like, we only buy books that are in diamond. Oh, excuse me. I'm in diamond. Huh? Huh? You're in diamond with this. Isn't that what we're talking about? Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just, it's, it was, it was maddening. Uh, and I, but I can imagine how many people, they get on a, on a monthly basis back then of like, Hey man, buy my comic. And they're like, well, we only buy stuff in diamond and it's probably a big hubbub, you know, cause not all stores will do like local books. Like some will, some will be like, Hey, this is a local sure. guy and we're going to make a local section, but um, not all of them do that. Uh, and, and um, so we had a lot of sort of pushback uh, from places, but there were other places that were like, Oh yeah, this is really good. So, you know, again, I don't know how much of that matter, really. Um, I never got invited to a California con or a California uh, retail store for like a signing or anything. Not true. Not true. Um, okay. Beach Ball Comics. Beach Ball Comics uh, invited us out a couple of times for some of their events, or like for like their free comic book day stuff. So it wasn't like a Tom come and do this for you, but it was a, hey, come be part of like a larger event. So their Beach Ball Comics was very good. Um, but, uh, but yeah, mostly it was just sort of like, well, I mean, we might get a couple copies. Like that was, that was sort of our response. Um, sure. but if you have, you know, 500 stores that buy, you know, on an average of five copies, there's 2,500 copies, you know, obviously. So we obviously sold a little more than that, but, um, because again, in the context of comic book stores and how many there are, there's really only about 500 comic book stores out of all of the ones that buy books that buy any sort of heavy uh, independent stuff, whether it's image or dark horse or, you know, whatever, there's only about 500 that buy heavy on that stuff. And the other, you know, one to 2000, um, I don't even know where it is at this point, but back in the day, you know, there were about 3000 comic book stores. So the other 2,500 stores were very sporadic in what they bought as far as indie stuff. Um, and it was generally like, yeah, we'll buy the walking dead, of course, but you know, you're going to buy a penny for your soul. What the hell is that? So, you know, it was, it was hard. And that's where the cons came in. So we would go into different locations. We'd go to Florida. We'd go to uh, South Carolina. We'd go to Chicago, C2E2. We would hit these pockets of, of places that, that maybe no one would even have been buying our book. But because we went and met those people, those people then went back, uh, trickle-down effect to their store. Hey, I met this guy at C2E2. Uh, you know, how do we get his books in here? And then, you know, 
hopefully we got the books in there. Mm-hmm. Um, so where do you think when you're starting out and then we'll, we'll move past this part because I know I'm stuck here because I keep asking you these questions. No, it's good. Do you think a lot of the sales came from, do you think they were coming from just California or do you think they were coming from like places? Oh, no. like New York or, okay. I, I, I learned very quickly. What's the initial that, book? Yeah. I, I learned very quickly that California was not going to work for us uh, as, okay. as diverse and indie centric as they all claim to be. Uh-huh. Uh, just stay away from California, guys. Uh, especially once we got out into the world a little bit, we discovered really that the further east you go, the more the doors opened. Midwest, wow. Get out to New York, wow. You know, even when we did Heroes Con in, in Florida, they weren't great, but they were looking at comics. Um, we do cons out in California. It was, they were brutal, those cons, because unless you're like Marvel or DC. Right. Um, you know, they're like, yeah, wh- why do we care about you? And I'm like, well, cause it's something that you haven't seen. And they're like, yeah. So why do I care? Because you haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. Like give, maybe it's, maybe it's something that you like. I mean, if you like Buffy, maybe you'll like Ursa minor. They, they, they have the Venn diagram crossover elements that you like, you know, that kind of stuff. So, um, but yeah, no, I, I ditched California like so fast as far as doing cons and stuff, because I'm like, no. This is just not worth my time, my effort. Um, I would much rather spend more money and go somewhere else uh, and, and, and do it that way. So the one exception for California was uh, here, uh, uh, when WonderCon was still up in San Francisco. Uh, we did that, I think, twice. And that was amazing. When it came down to Anaheim, dumpster fire. So it was like, nope, I'm not. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> But again, even if you go north, so like uh, uh, um, Washington, Emerald City, great con up there. That is a true, serious, and still a very serious comic con. So that's a that's a great one as far as West Coast people. So, what do you feel is more important, comic shops or uh, conventions? Uh, in if this you market, one. Yeah, in this market, I don't think. I can't say that retail shops are, 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 are pointless, but there's, it's so hard to get into them because there's so few that really care. Jesse James comics, um, uh, space cadet comics with, with, uh, Jen King is great. There are some that really dive all the way in and they're fantastic shops. Um, but more often than not, you go into a comic shop and you ask for something like, scout comics or, or, or vaults or something like that, you're going to get like this glassy eyed look of like, what are you talking about? Um, and so it's really, really difficult for, for small press people to get into those stores unless they're local. Like you have source point press here in the Midwest. They scout, they did what I did really. You know, they scour the Midwest. They have people all over the place talking to retail stores. So they're in diamond. I mean, they, they go through the diamond system, but they also deal very direct with a lot of retail stores um, doing signings and stuff like that. So there's a hundred percent value in, in both directions. I think cons might be better just because of the pure amount of eyeballs that you mm-hmm. can reach, but just because the eyeballs are there, doesn't mean that they're there for you. Um, especially at larger cons that have like the movie stars and stuff. A lot of those people are only there to get Tom Holland's autograph and go home after they spent their $400. So it really depends on the con. I've done a couple of small cons this year uh, just single day shows and they are unbelievably good. Um, for these, we, we just talked at mighty con mighty con was fantastic for me for that one day. Um, and it was on a Sunday of all things. So, um, I love small, I do, I do big shows, but I love small shows because the, the crowd knows what they're there for and it's comics and, and related things. There's not really generally, I mean, there might be a power ranger or something there, but it's not mm-hmm. like, you know, Chris Evans is there to, to kind of suck the money out of the room. So it's a very different experience at the small cons. Um, and I, I really like them. I just got invited to another one down in Florida. This will be my, my, my <laughs> decade return to Florida. Uh, Cause I haven't done Megacon in a decade. So uh, I got invited by Carrie Tarpley down to go to Sun Coast Comic Con uh, in a couple of weeks. So I'm going back to Florida now. That's awesome. So, um, so you've been publishing for about 12 years. So how many books are you putting out? Well, at our peak, we were doing anywhere between two to five a month 
okay. uh, way back then. That's when we were monthly. That's when we uh-huh. were really, we had all the wheels turning sure. now because of, because we've left diamond, uh, we're not doing monthly books. We're doing essentially quarterly books with occasionally, you know, some extra things sprinkled in because everything we do now is Kickstarter. So um, we only do uh, basically now like one title per year. So like this year, for example, is Ursa Minor's 10 year anniversary. So of our four planned key Kickstarter uh, uh, campaigns, three of them will be Ursa Minor focused to celebrate the 10 year anniversary. The first one we already did in January, that's, that's done and gone. We actually crowdfunded uh, a critter action figure um, in January. So um, that was our like big pop for 2022. Like, Yo, we are putting toys on the shelves, man. Uh, and we got it done. So we're hoping to have those things available soon. Um, but uh, so in two days from when we're filming this, not from when you're reading it, April 2nd, um, we are launching the first campaign for Ursa Minor. Uh, it'll be a 20-page book. It'll be the continuation of the series as it's been going on. And then in July, we will do the next issue, which will be a 40-page book. And then we'll do another 40 page book in October. Um, and then there'll be things sprinkled in along the way, uh, smaller campaigns. Like we do, um, it, it, May 22nd is a uh, uh, world goth day. And so we've kind of adopted that as, as one of our little fun things to do every year. Uh, we, we originally did it in 2020. We just did some fun covers, some goth alternatives of our characters, just did covers. Uh, people really liked it. We did an actual issue last year. Uh, as soon as people got the book, they were screaming because they had to wait a year to get another one. And I'm like, well, that's the way that annual things work, folks. So now we have Goth Day Part 2 planned for this year. So that'll just be a week-long uh, campaign in between our bigger campaigns. Um, so, yeah, that's that's really kind of how we do it. So so let, let's expand on that a little bit. How did that come about? Because you're, you're, you're in the shops. You're going through Diamond. You're in the shops. Yeah. And, and I know that uh, I had seen your stuff in Graham Crackers Comics here. Sure. I go. Yep. Um, and so when did that, what, what helped you decide to make a switch? Uh, we were, after our first four years, mm-hmm. we moved everything to be under the Aspen Comics umbrella, Michael Turner's company. Yeah. Um, Vince Hernandez, Frank Mastromoro, Peter Steigerwald, they published our books. Um, We felt that we had reached a sort of glass ceiling of of our potential growth uh, as far as where we were. And we felt that we needed to modify what we did uh, or find somebody to sort of, you know, vouch for us. And we thought that if a a larger company would, would sort of say, Hey, yeah, we believe in what this stuff is, we could take another step up. So Aspen came in, and, and printed our stuff for three years. Um, but at the end of that third year, they sold part of the company to a, a movie studio because they want to produce Fathom and Soulfire stuff uh, for Hollywood. And so at that point, there was no space for us to be in the company anymore because ever, all focus was on those things. So when I came out of that, it was, it was about five years ago now-ish. Uh, since that happened um, and I had a decision, it was, okay, do I go back to the old system, which I had left kind of already because I was like, I, I, it's not working. I'm going to go to Aspen. Um, I mean, not that it was, wasn't working, but it wasn't, I, I wasn't finding the way to grow with it. So, okay. um, so we went to Aspen and if so, if I, could, I knew I could go back, but I was like, what's different. And, and really the landscape after then, at that point, seven years of, of doing comics, the landscape was very different. Um, and crowdfunding had become sort of a thing that was happening in a much larger sense. And so while I had tinkered with Kickstarter twice prior, just to kind of try it out with completely new books, because I wanted to see like, okay, what would happen if I went to Kickstarter? Um, those two books were not indicative of, of anything because one, a lot of people didn't realize that we still existed once we went to Aspen. They thought, they thought we were gone because we're not in the catalog anymore. Oh, I guess Big Dog gone. No, 
dummy. I'm on social media every day telling you we're with Aspen. I'm showing you pictures that we're traveling with Aspen. I, I can't understand the algorithms that, that people are following us and are like, well, Tom's gone, I guess. No, what are you talking about? So it was really frustrating. And so uh, when we did Kickstarter, when I decided to do the Kickstarter, I was like, what if I just came back and started where I started before? Let's do a Kickstarter for a new volume of Penny for Your Soul. Uh, because that's where we started seven years ago. So the first two Kickstarter campaigns we did barely scratched nine, 10,000, something like that. Barely scratched that. Um, so when we did Penny for Your Soul, we immediately did 16,000 um, right off the bat. And I was like, okay, something's here. And we did it again. We did another issue, even though everybody told me, Dude, everybody, all the Kickstarter geniuses told me, you cannot do one, two, three, four, five, six, seven on Kickstarter. Your attrition will be in the tank. And I said, you're wrong. My attrition has never been in the tank on any book I've ever done. There's no reason it would be at least bad here any worse than it is on, on, in, in the larger scale. So I said, go away. I'm going to do this my way. Again, another chip to the shoulder. Um, second issue we did, did basically the same thing, almost the exact same dollar amount, 16,000 and some change. Um, I think we had a few, a, a few less backers, but not again, not significant, but the money was the same. Then we went to issue three and issue three went from 16 to 20, uh, issue four went from 20 to 24, so on and so on and so on. By the time we got to issue seven, we were at $34,000, 600 backers. We grew it rather than had it fall off the cliff. Uh, and at, at the end of that run, which was about a year and a half, because we did them every you know quarter, basically, uh, I realized that this was a very viable way to sell comics, to produce comics, to make comics, to reach a completely different audience in a lot of cases. Because I, I know there are still people that used to buy our books in stores that have no idea that we're on Kickstarter. They have no clue that these books still exist. Uh, because I go to cons and people are surprised to see me. Yo, where you been? I'm like, I, I've been to cons. I've been online. I've been making books. I've been, I've been everywhere. Where have you been? That's the question. Um, but that's just the way that life works is you, you know, it's really hard to connect with all of these people that you had in this bubble for a while. And now you've moved yourself to another bubble. You got to find a way to get them to, to, to talk to each other again. And it's been difficult, but we've been growing through this process of, of doing all these books over a period of time, um, we've created sort of a system, a methodology. Um, we're not trying to like be Brian Polito and, and, and Lady Death and, and you know, make $100,000. That's not the goal. We're not here to like try and fleece uh, uh, our, our buyers with like, hey, there's, there's, you know, eight different variant covers. And then there's like seven variants of there's like a blue one and a green one and an orange one. So like, no, I'm not doing that. Um, but even within our more simplistic approach, we're seeing growth, um, albeit slower than some of the other guys, uh, which is fine. They can do it the way they want to do it. It's, it. I have no problem with it. But for me, I'm not going to like dive in and be and pretend that that's the way that I do things. I, I always have been sort of I'm going to do it my way. I mean, that's, that's the theme of this show. I'm doing it my way. Um, and my way right now, at least, is I want to take care of my customer base uh, to a point where they don't feel that when a, on a Kickstarter launches, that they're suddenly out $1,000 in order to get you know everything that they want to get. We try and make sure that it's very easy for people to get the pieces that they want, if they just want pieces, or if they want it all, uh, it's it's still not going to you know break their bank every time we do this. So. Um, are we going to grow out of that? Of course. We, ideally, we will grow. We'll find new ways to do things. Um, but uh, for right now, it's 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 methodical and it's uh, you know step by step by step growth. So, um, do you think that? I mean, this is this conversation is one of the most fascinating conversations I've had, and um, and, and so I'm I'm I, I'm really curious. You know, it sounds to me. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounds to me like 
a lot of what you did, you just did on instinct. You didn't really like check with anybody. Was there a business model you were looking at? Or were you looking at somebody being like, I want to be like them or I want to outdo them? You no. know, whether it was, okay. It was, it was pure. What, what is it today? The only thing that, that, and I've talked about this before, the only thing that I had, uh, and I'm really glad I had it because it made me think about things that I would not have even considered like barcodes um, was Josh Blaylock from Devil's Do. Mm -hmm. He put out a book uh, called How to Self-Publish Comics, yeah. Not Just yeah. Create Them, something like yeah, that. I think I've got that here someplace. Yeah. And, and I grabbed that on a lark um, just because, okay, tell me, tell me what I need to know, Josh. Um, and I'm so glad I did because it's a fantastic book and it's been, it's been, it's constantly in print. So anybody who, who wants it, go look it up. Josh Blaylock, how to self publish comics, not just create them. Um, there's different versions. It's been revised and so on. But um, that was one of the things that helped me sort of key in to things that I didn't know. Uh, again, he, he came from the publisher side, which was information that I never had in the early days. Now, once I was with Aspen, again, I got sort of a taste of like, okay, what does a publisher do? Well, how, do they, how does Aspen do it versus how do I do it? So on and so on and so on. Um, so it was really great to have uh, uh, Josh's book and then the Aspen thing. But in those first four years before Aspen, it was the wild west for us. It was, where are we going? What are we taking? Who are we bringing? Uh, you know, what book are we doing now? It was, you know, we had Penny for Your Soul and Critter the first year. The second year, we launched uh, Legend of Oz, The Wicked West. The year after that, we launched Ursa Minor. The year after that, we launched Scheherazade. It was like every year we were launching a new book as well. So um, we just were like, man, let's, let's go. And, and the things that worked, we hung on to. The things that sort of didn't work, we were like, okay, that doesn't work. Let's, let's adjust and, and do it this way over here. Um, and, and that was it. It was, it, like I said, yeah, instinct is, is a great, is a great thing. I had no ment I had no writing mentors. I was a D student in English. There's no reason I should be a writer for a living. Um, I found Carrie Castor when we moved to the, to the Midwest, uh, completely by accident. We were at C2E2. Uh, my wife came home. I don't know why. I think it was something to do with the dogs. She came home and she saw, uh, Carrie and her friends in front of their house, they lived like a block down and they were out front in cosplay gear. And so uh, my wife went up and, and parked next to them and they're like, you guys going to the con? They're like, yeah. And she, and so she's like, we'll go to booth, whatever it was. And, and cause that's where we're going to be with big dog. Inc. And they were like, okay. And they actually showed up. So they showed up at the booth. That's where I met Carrie and Aaron and, and all this crew. Um, and we found out that Carrie was a, a writer herself. She became my editor. She still is my editor. Um, and so uh, it was, it's, yeah, it's just, it's just a wild ride. I mean, it's just, it's dominoes falling and, and, you know, wherever they go, that's where we're, that's where we're going next. What do you, um, so how do you publicize? I mean, it sounds like you do a lot of social media yeah. and you obviously do conventions, but how else? I mean, do you, do you reach out to your readers? Do you have a newsletter? Do you? Sure. Okay. Yeah, we, it's, it's mostly, it's mostly the social media, really. I mean, I live on Facebook. Anybody who, who wants to follow me, I'm on Facebook. We do Twitter, Instagram, all this stuff too. But um, as far as my the, the, sort of the, 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 the head of the snake, it's, it's Facebook. That's where we do. Uh, we disseminate most of our information first, and then it goes outwards. Um, we have uh, uh, an email list, of course, that we've compiled over the years. Uh, so people get get stuff sent to them when we do our Kickstarters. But it's not really because we don't really have monthly things happening. We don't really do monthly updates. Um, the, the, the social media really should be taking care of most of that um, as far as like, well, here's some preview stuff and, and whatever. Um, and then when we get to when we get today, basically, uh, as we're about to launch or some minor on Saturday, um, we'll be sending out the 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 preview thing. Uh, here's all the, here's all the art, get ready for Saturday, you know, whatever. Um, but that's, we don't do a lot of that. Uh, again, I, I, I don't want to spam people. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want people to feel like they're being spammed. So um, again, a, a lot of this stuff just comes back to like, and, and, and I could be completely wrong in all of this, but basically everything that I do, I judge based on what I would want, 
to have happen. Like if I'm part of somebody else's newsletter, am I getting four or five a month? Am I getting one a month? Am I getting one every, like, what am I comfortable with? And, and generally if I see one a month, that's probably fine. Um, but usually within that, th- there's information that doesn't matter to me. Um, Cause it's like, well, we're going to be in California for a con. I don't care. I'm not going to California to your con. So it doesn't matter. So for me, it's, you know, I try and keep the information very, very specific. Um, it's generally around our Kickstarter events uh, because then my thought process is if they get involved in the event, they will then get involved in the other things that are happening. Cause we, as we do the event, as we do the Kickstarter, we talk about all the other things that we're doing too. Oh, Hey, you know, if you're a Kickstarter pledge or if you're a backer uh, you know, we're going to be at this con, we would love to see you, that kind of stuff. So we kind of, everything kind of hovers around social media and Kickstarters. And then, you know, we try and, you know, blow the bubble up from there. Mm-hmm. So, um, so you said you have something coming out on Saturday. Yeah. Yeah. Saturday okay. is Ursa Talk Minor. A little bit yep. about that. Yeah. So I'm unprepared. There's nothing okay. here. <laughs> You've had a week to prepare. I know. Right. There's, uh, there's comics everywhere in front of me, not a single Ursa Minor book. Uh-huh. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's our 10 year anniversary for Ursa Minor. So it's our horror title. Uh, it's the third, no, sorry. The fourth book that we, we published. Uh, back in 2012, um, vampires, werewolves, all the blood, claws, and fangs that we love, you know, from, from the 80s and 90s types of horror movies. Uh, our lead character is Naomi. She's the last of the were bears. Uh, it is a, uh, it's a very, fairly, uh, fairly deep universe and world that we have uh, where basically Naomi and, and her buddies uh, each night go out, knock off a couple of vampires, they realize quickly that that's a numbers game that just doesn't work because all the other vampires are just biting more people and making more vampires. So taking down a couple just doesn't mean anything. So in the first volume, they have to go about figuring out a way to take out vampires in bulk, uh, which they figure out a way to do that. I'm not going to tell you what the way that is because that's why you read the book. But um, within that context, we, we uh, create this larger scope of this story, um, which has been which was touched on in volume two little by little by little, uh, and now diving headlong into as we go into volume three, as, uh, as our version of Dracula rises. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, he wants to uh, sort of reclaim old school style power for the vampires across the world, not this sort of political nonsense that's going on. Uh, he wants to take it back to the, the old days, the good old days, the running with the pack. Um, and, uh, of course, Naomi and, and her friends have their, their jobs to do while Dracula is, you know, making problems too. So um, it's, uh, it should be a pretty, it's a pretty rough book. It's, it does get bloody and, and, you know, there's biting and scratching and de-arming and, you know, things like that. It's, it's, it's a horror book, um, but, uh, but it is fun. It's set in a lot of things that people understand, like, you know, uh, Lady Bathory and, and uh, all the tropes, like, uh, uh, but we play with them in some of our own ways. Like, what is it? Why are, why are uh, werewolves and vampires both susceptible to silver? Um, what does it really mean to kill the head vampire? Uh, you know, all those kinds of things. But we kind of take those tropes and, and use them in our own ways uh, and, and explain them in our own ways. So it's, it's a fun book. It's a fun book. That sounds really great. So how, how big are these books that you're doing uh, quarterly? How, how, oh, pages. So what we do yeah. now, and we kind of fell into this after the Penny for Your Soul seven issue run that took like a year and a half. Um, I realized that it would take me forever to get through these, these story arcs. So we went from doing an issue at a time to what we do now, because generally our story arcs are about five issues long. And then we do like a trade paperback. So the first issue now, and we just started doing this last year, the first issue is 20 pages, like your, your average 20 page comic book. Uh, and then the next two are 40 pages. So essentially within three campaigns, you're getting five issues worth of content, um, which is essentially for us, again, a story arc. So every year we will produce a story arc for whatever it is that we're doing. Um, and that's sort of our, again, that's sort of our methodology right now. That's sort of, we've grown into that aspect of it. And had I done that with Penny for Your Soul, you know, we would have been able to get through that so much faster. Uh, and who knows where we would have been from a system wise at that point. But at that time, again, everything Kickstarter was, was instinct. I didn't have anybody telling me how to do it, you know, do this, do that. I I watched people, how they did it. I thought I understood things. 
some I did, some I didn't. Um, but again, just growth, figuring out our way of doing things. And that's kind of where we are at now is, uh, is 20, 40, 40. Um, and so how many, what's your staff like? How many people do you have working on these books? This is it. <laughs> it's me. Okay. Uh, and then, well, there's an artist and a, and a colorist and so on, but yeah. Sure. Um, you know, each book is a little different because, uh, sometimes you have an artist, sometimes you need an inker, sometimes you don't, um, you know, but basically there's the artist, the colorist, the letterer, uh, Carrie, of course, edits the scripts. I write the scripts. So there's five people. Um, and then however many cover folks that we do, like on this particular one, there are, uh, seven, uh, well, seven starting covers. We, we do some add-ons as the campaigns go along, but there's seven beginning covers. Um, we also have a cosplayer who's doing some cosplay stuff for us. So there's some mm-hmm. cosplay on this one. Uh, which is not what well, we don't do that all the time, but in this case we did. Um, and, um, and then, like I said, as we go through the campaigns, we do unlock stuff. So like every hundred backers will unlock some new item, special item that people can grab. Um, you know, and that, and that helps keep the, the Kickstarter campaigns moving a little bit, especially as you get into those like middle weeks, everything kind of tends to slow down. So you got to kind of keep some momentum going. Um, and so that's where you kind of be like, okay, well now here's, here's this book or this trading card set or, you know, whatever it is um, just to kind of maintain some momentum as we drive into uh, the final week, which for us, we really only do three week campaigns. Now I don't even do four week campaigns. I'm mm-hmm. sick of four week campaigns. Everything we do is, is three weeks. It's tight. It's let's go, let's go, let's go. There's, there's no reason to be waiting everybody. Um, let's just get it done and move on to the next one. Interesting. So um, I think we're going to wrap up here, but I'm curious, is there anything, anything else you want people to know? Where can people find you on social media? Uh, you, you did mention Facebook and, and how you love Twitter and all those other places as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so where can, where can people find you? Yeah, so Facebook, um, you can find me. You can just look me up, uh, friend me up if you want. There's also the Big Dog Inc. Uh, sort of you know, fan page. Um, the width, there's like 29,000 people there. So go, go join the fan page. If you like that, um, as far as Twitter and Instagram, uh, it's BDI comics for both of them. So you can follow us there. Um, and then we have a Patreon as well. Uh, so it's patreon.com backslash big dog Inc. Um, basically all the folks on Patreon, um, it's a, it's a monthly subscription thing. So there's a $5 level. There's a $10 level. The $5 level gets you everything. Uh, that's all you got to do. Just come in. It's five bucks a month. You'll get all the posts. We do all kinds of preview stuff. You get to watch covers happen from lines to inks, to colors, to, to logos. You get to watch the process of everything happening. Um, and then the $10 level, if you get $10 a month, uh, every six months, uh, we have a free variant cover that only our $10 patrons, our VIP patrons, they just get a free book. It's like, hey, thank you for being here for another six months. Here's a free you know, bonus variant cover for you. They also all get various um, uh, special offers for books that only they can buy. And the $10 people also get to vote on things. Um, They have, uh, in the past, they've gotten to vote on uh, characters' names uh, for us. We give them a list of like, here's here's the list. Tell us what you guys think this character should be named. Um, They they threw a monkey wrench uh, in the works on the last one because I had four different names um, and we ended up having a tie for three of the names. So I'm like, I don't know what you guys want me to do with that. So I have to figure that part out, but you know, that's part of the fun of, of being part of a group. Um, I'm sure they all probably got together and just said, let's just rig this thing and really throw Tom for a loop. I'm sure that's what happened. That's exactly what Um, happened, you know? Uh, And so, (laughs) so, uh, so yeah, so Patreon is really fun. Again, we've got like 30, 30 some people there uh, hanging out with us every month. Um, and, uh, and that's it. And then, like I said, we're going to be doing, uh, if you're in Florida, uh, it's going to be right down by Tampa. Um, I can't think of the actual city, but it's just a little South of Tampa is Suncoast comic con, April 23rd and 24th. Um, I do a Sunday live show as well on Facebook with, uh, Marissa Pope and Ryan Kincaid and April Reyna and guests, CB Zane, Nia Rufino. Um, it's called Sunday sketching. We, we actually focus on other people's Kickstarters. Um, and, and let them come on and talk about their campaigns while all the artists draw characters from their books. So it's a really fun, interesting, uh, 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 little, little couple hour show. So if you're on Facebook Sunday sketch, and we do it most Sundays, obviously there's cons and holidays that get in the way, but, um, 
you know, just check, check with us and we'll, we'll let you know what's coming. But uh, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I think that pretty much covers it. Great. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And yeah, thanks for uh, having me. Sure. Anytime you're, you're welcome back anytime. I, I, th- th- this was fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and so if you want to stick around for just a second, I'm just going to do my the little wrap up here. Thank yep. you very much for watching. Um, please look up Tom. And also, if you are interested in a free digital copy of Visitations Number 1, just email me at visitationscomicbook, all one word, at gmail.com. The link is below, as is all the links for Tom's stuff. So check him out as well. Uh, thank you very, very, very much for, for that. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll catch you next time.